thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Zainab Meborno from the University of Leicester and part of CTPSR. Today, um, it's all about Halava Huts, understanding local mechanisms for conflict transformation in Liberia. We have our very own Nancy, Dr. Nancy Anand, who is going to take us through her research and break it down just so that we understand what Palava Huts is all, are all about and understanding the local mechanisms of conflict in Liberia. I also have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Alex Thompson from the School of Humanities, who is, our, who is going to be our discussant for today. Um, over now to you, Alex. Hey, well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, uh, this, this group. Uh, my name is Alex Thompson. Uh, I work over in the, uh, the School of Humanities. Uh, I've been around at Coventry University for quite a long time. In, in fact, I was I was at the, uh, the initial strategy and planning meetings of uh, CTPSR uh, way, way back, decades back. Uh, so kind of with uh, all, all various people, Neil Forbes uh, and... Uh, uh, but anyway, I, I, I was I was there at the birth of CTPSR, and uh, I think it's it's grown up an awful lot, and it uh, it lost its parents long long time ago, uh, and I you know kind of uh, it's grown into something much bigger than we thought it would uh, ever be. I think and far more successful, so that, that's good. And thank you uh, for inviting me along. Um, why have you invited me? Uh, good good question. Uh, well, I, I, I do know something about African politics, although I'm stuck over in uh, humanities. Uh, I'm a curriculum lead there now, so I, effectively I stayed on the teaching side, at the great research teaching split. Uh, I remained on the teaching side, uh, but I, I have published on African politics in uh, a number of journals. Uh, I've, I've got a, a textbook on African politics that you may know about. Uh, but I think specifically I've been invited to this because uh, a little while back, uh, probably 12 years ago, I was involved uh, with transitional justice in Zimbabwe uh, and published a number of items uh, on that, uh, essentially advocating for bringing the grassroots into uh, what was then kind of a, a power sharing uh, a, agreement uh, and a potential, I don't think anybody thought it was going to get off the ground, but there was just potential uh, for uh, some kind of transitional justice to occur in Zimbabwe. As we know, that didn't turn out so well, but I think uh, kind of what I learned there is, is, is kind of relevant here in the sense it's, it's, still, it's still the same process of transitional justice from below. So as I'm, uh, I'm still an advocate of that and a believer in that, I, I believe that's why I've been invited uh, along today. Uh, so I'm sympathetic uh, to uh, this topic uh, but but let, let's see uh, kind of where we get with that. So that's me in a roundabout way. Thank you very much, Alex. So without wasting time, over to you, Nancy. Thank you very much, um, Zainab. Thank you, um, Jessica, Alex, and the Africa Research Group uh, for the opportunity to, um, to share some of my uh, findings uh, of my doctoral research. Um, so just to give a brief background to this presentation, um, um, this presentation forms part of my PhD thesis, which looked at um, building peace after war, the contributions of local infrastructures for peace in post-conflict Liberia. Uh, the, uh, it was guided by a main research question in what ways and to what extent uh, um, do local infrastructures for peace contribute to peace building in, in post-conflict uh, societies. The purpose of my study was to reinforce the relevance of local uh, peace building, but also to highlight and enhance understanding on the contributions of local infrastructures in peace building, and also stimulate debate on local approaches to sustainable peace in post-conflict um, societies. So what do I mean by local infrastructures for peace? So LIPs, as I call them, forms part of the broader infrastructures for peace, which was introduced by John Paul Lederach in the 90s. Um, so Lederach's introduction of this concept was based on, on the idea that peace building interventions um, could have a long-term success um, when it allows for um, local or community uh, level engagement 
with um, and higher level um, actors. Um, so um, for the purpose of my, um, um, my research, I, I define local infrastructures for peace as um, informal community-based structures, groups, networks, and practices that foster interaction and create spaces for prevention and peaceful transformation of conflict uh, uh, um, towards sustainable peace within societies. Um, and uh, in his peace building uh, pyramid, Lederach equally highlights um, different levels of um, actors essential to peace building. And for my research, I, I position local infrastructures for peace at the grassroots level leadership. And some of the um, local infrastructures for peace whose work I explored during my research um, um, in Liberia included um, county peace committees, women peace hearts, um, chiefs and elders, Council, who are also known as the elder elders councils, being our community forums, we have um, in, in youth intellectual forums, and early warning and early response um, and monitors for groups. So um, the research was conducted, like as I said earlier, in Liberia, where I spent four months engaging with different uh, um, stakeholders. It was it was a qualitative research with a case study approach, uh, where I conducted uh, the study in six regions, or what they call in Liberia counties, and this included um, um, Monserrado County, um, Grand Jide, Grand Bassa, Nimba, uh, Bon, and Bomi counties, and out of these six regions or counties, 11 communities were, were visited as shown uh, with the red indications on the map on the slide. And the reason for doing this is that um, Liberia has 15 counties and so to enable the representative um, findings. So um, as I indicated, I conducted um, the research in six counties uh, in Liberia out of the 15. And this was to give a representative uh, uh, representation to the findings that uh, I collated. And out of these six counties, I, uh, I visited 11 communities. Um, you know, 78 semi structured interviews were conducted with civil society organizations, local NGOs, community based groups, UN and other international organizations, as well as their government institutions, and 21 focus groups. Um, discussions were, com uh, were also conducted with community members and other community groups, uh, youth groups, women groups. And these two main uh, research data collection methodologies were complemented or supplemented with a non-participant observation. So um, with regards to conceptualizing peace building, uh, my study engaged uh, with several theoretical debates, and this includes the everyday, everyday peace, hybridity, and liberal peace. Um, while it critiqued liberal peace for its extensive focus on, uh, on, on an internationalist and state-centric approaches, it concurred with the everyday peace and, and, and hybridity discourses, noting the importance of uh, recognizing and leveraging local peace Peace building initiatives of local actors in post conflict societies. In addition to that, I engaged more broadly with the concept of peace building. And, uh, and peace building has several definitions, but there's also a consensus that peace building must include tra the transformation and prevention of conflict. Um, so drawing on the various literature um, for my study, peace building was composed of two components, conflict transformation and conflict prevention with the, with the um, former um, addressing um, the focusing on, on rebuilding peaceful relations and the, and the latter addressing um, structural causes of the conflict. So this presentation um, focuses on my findings on how these local infrastructures for peace use this culturally embedded mechanism of the Palava Hut to transform conflict within communities and also build peace. So um, in conflict transformation, peace is noted to be centered and rooted in the quality of relationships. So it enables, it, in other words, it helps to foster peaceful relationships within uh, uh, conflict and post-conflict societies. The conflict transformation as a concept, which also which emerged in the in the 90s, also encourages the use of um, local mechanism, and it has different elements as part of the transformation process, and, and this include dialogue, which enables 
those uh, um, exchanges and exposes the causes of the conflict, mediation and reconciliation. Um, according to Lederach, um, again, who is a key proponent of conflict transformation, um, he notes that conflict transformation must lead to four main outcomes or what he calls the goals of conflict transformation. And these include the personal transformation, which must lead to changes in the emotional, perceptual and spiritual aspect of the conflict and conflict parties, um, relational transformation, which must also lead to reforms um, in interaction, communication and interdependence among the uh, conflicting parties. And then structural transformation, uh, which involves you know, the use of nonviolent mechanism, inclusive decision making, um, institutional reforms and, and structural an analysis as in to understand the causes of the conflict. And then there is a cost uh, cultural transformation, which calls for the use of um, resources within the setting and also changes in the cultural pattern of the conflict. I use these goals as a framework to assess the contributions of the Palava Hat as used by these LIPs to an, uh, and their contribution to conflict transformation in Liberia, which I will discuss later. And the reason for that is because um, these uh, indicate uh, they provide useful indicators um, for conflict transformation and, 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 and peace building in, in, in the context that I was um, I was researching in the conflict transformation. Um, was found to be a very important component or peace building component in Liberia because um, Liberia is a West African country that experienced civil war from 1989 to 2003. And this 14 year civil war resulted in the death of over 300,000 civilians with several uh, uh, thousand uh, injured and others becoming refugee, uh, refugees until it was resolved in um, 2003 through the signing of the comprehensive peace agreement. This conflict did not only cause lives and destruction of properties, um, but it also resulted in, in fractured relationships or relational deficits in, in many Liberian communities. As the, the quotes below notes, one of the uh, people I interacted with indicated that the war brought division and tribalism amongst us. Brothers and sisters were against one another. People had hatred for one another. Um, they, they noted at the fact that you know people whose families were killed or raped by ex-combatants who used to be neighbors now harbored a hatred for these as combatants in the community. So hatred was, uh, you know, people had bitterness and hatred against each other. Um, and with that also, um, um, there was an increase as a result of the war, there was an increase in social conflicts and social issues as noted by another re research participant. After the war ended we, and we returned, the disputes were many because people had hatred for each other. Uh, so issues such as land conflicts, sexual and gender-based violence, social crimes, Inter-ethnic tensions, uh, um, family and marital disputes were noted to be, you know, form part of the everyday experiences of many local Liberians. Um, land conflict, for example, um, was not uh, was not, you know, uh, an issue prior to the war. But after the war, it has become a main source of conflict within communities um, because people who fled for people who fled from the war and came back came back to find their lands occupied by others, and this resulted in conflict within and among even families, family members sometimes. So all these issues brought about fractured relations within many communities in in Liberia. To address these fragmented relations within communities, um, these local infrastructures for peace maximize the culturally embedded mechanism called the Palava Hat um, to transform conflict within these communities. Um, so Palava Hat is, is, was used as, a, is used as a conflict transformation tool. And this is a long-standing traditional mediation and reconciliation mechanism, which exists in all communities in Liberia to foster truth telling, um, healing, and peaceful relations. Um, it is an essential conflict transformation tool um, that is used by these local infrastructures for peace to address conflict. Um, it's sometimes called the peace hut in Liberia, um, but popularly known as the palava hut. So um, because in Liberia, palava means trouble or problems. Um, so it connotes a place where you go um, to resolve uh, um, and address uh, problems peacefully. 
As one of our research participants noted, the Palava Hut is a culture we use for addressing conflict within our communities peacefully. Um, so the Palava Hut is a concept, you know, and can take place in, in, in different forms or any location that is accepted uh, within the communities. Um, it, it, it is often organized in public uh, places. Um, it can be in the form of a hut, as you can see on the, uh, in the slide, or it can take place under a tree. It can uh, uh, at the town square or the chief's palace. Um, you know, a, a pub, uh, an accepted location within the community where everybody can take part of the process. It's usually often used to address, you know, social or uh, civil cases such as land conflict, um, inter-community tensions, family dispute, inter-ethnic disputes, among others. The process is more uh, restorative than it is retributive. Um, as compared to the former court, um, it is hinged on forgiveness, apologies, um, consensus, among others. Uh, and it, even in times that fines and punishments are used, which we will discuss later, it's aimed to compensate rather than as a retributive justice uh, approach. Um, in, uh, in fact, majority of the people that I spoke with noted that they prefer um, to address their issues through um, the Palava Heart than going to the former court because when they do go to the formal court, it brings more enmity than it brings peace. And for them, especially coming from war, building social relations is much more important um, to them. So this next slide this, uh, this demonstrates the process of the Palava Hut. So the Palava Hut, um, the process may slightly differ from community to community, but generally it follows a process where a complaint is made, often to the chief and elders council, who are noted to be the custodian of traditional governance in Liberian communities. Uh, and they are the ones who lead and convene the, the, the forum. So even in cases where other uh, local infrastructures for peace have to organize Palava Hut process, they, they involve these chiefs and elders council. It's also a demonstration of the collaboration between the various local infrastructures for peace. So um, when the complaint is made, a Palava Hut forum is convened. And like, like I said, the venue of this Palava Hut is in a public space where everybody can, can be part of the process. And this also engender trust and integrity in the process. Um, so the, on the day of the, um, of the forum, elders and other members of the panel are seated. The forum is introduced or opened at, uh, with a traditional ceremony of prayers or uh, libation to invite God. They believe that God being part of the process helps uh, with the decision making. Uh, mediation and we can see a dialogue uh, session begins. Witnesses are allowed to testif testify, sorry, and the chiefs uh, or the, the panel, Palava Hat panel, deliberate. Um, reconciliation session ensues and then there is a closing ceremony again with the um, with, uh, with a prayer or, or, or traditional um, ceremony. Now, each of these steps is critical to the process to, to uh, you know, achieving amicable results. For instance, in composing the panel of the Palava Art Committee or the uh, composing the Palava Art Committee, a lot of thinking goes into who can be part of this committee. Um, usually they, 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 they look for an influential person, often an elderly person, a person who is respected in the community and who has a more, a integrity so that um, their, their decisions can will be adhered to. So it's not, they don't just choose anybody, but people who are respectable within the community. And this is meant to enhance in trust in the, in the process. The introduction, in the, uh, for instance, with the li libation and the prayers um, um, is also a spiritual act that they believe is critical to the decision-making process. Um, Liberia is, uh, is a very religious uh, society. Uh, and so there's an eminent respect for, for deity, uh, for God in, in, in their everyday social life. Pray, they believe that prayers set the tone to bring or uh, the pathway to bring in God in helping the decision making that goes on in the, in the Palava Hat. Um, the mediation and, and, and the dialogue session also is critical uh, because it serves as a medium through which um, the people, they initiate peace, they understand the causes of the conflict and then you know find the amicable solution um, to the conflict.
the reconciliation session is equally very important. And here, several approaches uh, uh, or diverse approaches are used, including storytelling of parables, apologies and forgiveness, fines or punishment, consensus and compromise, um, smoking of the peace pipe. So storytelling is, for instance, is critical because um, the committee uses to help, to advise and help parties to understand each other. Um, they can, depending on the, if they know the family line or the background of the person, they use familiar stories that can speak to the people to help them to recognize that they are family and they have to forgive each other and stick together. Sometimes they draw on the faith of the uh, of, of the conflicting parties to, to admonish them. They can draw on the Bible or the Quran um, to admonish them and encourage them to find amicable um, solution to the conflict. Um, the apologies and the forgiveness in the, is also called to the reconciliation process um, because it, it, they encourage the um, the, the offender to apologize and the complainant to also forgive. And they often encourage them to let bygones to be bygones and let bygones be bygones and find amicable solution um, to reconcile. Um, this let bygones be bygones is a very popular ma mantra, if I can use that word, in Liberia. And uh, it's uh, noted to be a morally appealing narrative, which they use to encourage um, conflict parties to forgive and, and, and find solutions to the problems or to the conflict under the palaver heart. And, and, and oftentimes, um, well, fines and punishment are not the main thing, but sometimes uh, fines and punishment are instituted in the Palava, not as a as I said earlier, as a retributive element, but also, but mainly as to compensate um, the, the aggrieved person and also to deter future wrongful behaviors um, within the community. Uh, so fines and sometimes I use, and this can range from, you know, a tin of oil, cattle, money, doing some chores for the aggrieved person, such as fixing their, their fence or fixing damaged properties or farming and among others. Um, one of the critical parts of the reconciliation or the palaver hat as a whole is the smoking peace pipe. Uh, and this process, this ends, uh, it, this comes at the end of the process and, um, and it's a culture that symbolizes peace and reconciliation and in many Liberian communities. So the peace pipe is not an actual peace that you smoke, um, but <laughs> a culture or a gestures that, that are performed at the end of the, uh, of the process to demonstrate that the conflicting parties uh, 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 have forgiven each other and there is peace. And so this can, depending on the community, this can be, you know, the parties eating cola nut together. And cola nut is a seed of a plant and is very popular in many African countries. Uh, or drinking water from, um, from the same cup or eating from the same bowl, um, a handshake or hugging uh, each other to demonstrate that um, peace and, and reconciliation has been achieved. Um, in, 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 in the communities I visited, they describe this uh, um, peace pipe as uh, you know, Liberian communities were a version of uh, and, um, Again, so they may not sign, um, you know, high-level uh, documents or peace negotiation ag uh, agreements, but um, these this uh, peace pipe demonstrates uh, um, um, has some judicial and and reconciliatory legitimacy within a, a Liberian community. So overall, overall, the Palava had. Um, demonstrates that this process is very structured uh, it's a very structured process and and this co uh, contradicts um, some literatures labeling such local mechanisms as uh, as unstructured and vague the palaver had was found to be very structured approach that enabled people the channels to to address their issues dialogue, open up about their grievances and collectively find amicable um, solutions to their conflict or the problem. Uh, as I earlier indicated, um, um, I used the Lederax framework. I drew on Lederax framework to assess um, um, the Palava huts uh, or the contributions that the, uh, these local infrastructures make through the, uh, the use of the Palava hut for, uh, towards conflict transformation. And my study um, showed that the Palava hut as used by these LIPs um, contribute to all four 
goals of conflict transformation. Um, for instance, on the personal transformation, and um, this, this palava hat enables a perceptual, emotional, and, and uh, spiritual change. The dialogues, for example, the storytelling, the faith-based uh, admonitions or the parables, it helps to humanize the conflicting parties and, and appeals to their inner consciousness and, and shift perceptions from their differences to their similarities. One, one research participant noted that the prayers help to change the mindset of the conflicting parties because they believe in, the, in, 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 in their Christian faith and they be, or, or their religious beliefs and they believe the power of, of, of the deity or God, that, that prayers help to calm the minds of the people and also change their minds uh, of the conflicting parties. Another also noted that after the Palava had, he begged me, I, he, he openly apologized and begged me, so I forgave him. Uh, we are all Christians. Uh, we now speak to each other. So by noting that they are both Christians, they, they demonstrate that they, how they are grieved person began to see the similarities they both share uh, as one, uh, she, uh, uh, the similarities between her and the perpetrator um, contributing to uh, enabling healing and reconciliation. So they, they helped draw on the common values that, they, uh, that exist within the communities and drawing on those values that they share helps to, you know, transform their mindset, know that they are all one people, and, and, and that enables a, a process of healing and reconciliation. And when it comes to relational transformation, this palava hat enhances um, communication, interaction, and interdependence among the conflicting parties. Public element of the process itself, you know, being done in a public space uh, engenders a, a collective interdependency among the community members in addressing their, uh, their problems um, or rebuilding um, relationship between the co uh, conflicting parties. Because in that uh, open communal space, you know, where when friends, families, and, and community Communities members, community members meet a sense of unity is ignited amongst them, um, which enables uh, a, a conducive atmosphere um, for amicable resolution uh, of the conflict. The punishment also enable a, 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 a interaction um, between the conflicting parties. An example is a case of a, a, a war widow whose farm was destroyed by a, a um, if whose farm was destroyed by a, a neighbor's animal, and this is a main source of income because in many of these communities, farming is the main source of income. So this issue was taken to the Palava Hut, and and it's held, um, in the end they agreed to that the perpetrator or the the owner of that animal at, um, fixes her fence. And through that process, through that punishment or whatever it is, through that punishment, they will began to interact and in the end became friends. So there was a sort of relationship that was built at the end of the day of an issue that was, you know, for relationship that was initially fragmented. Um, so, yeah. And, and then we go to um, structural transformation. Um, the process enables and um, helps in identifying and understanding the root causes of the conflict. The Palava Hat itself um, is, uh, is a nonviolent approach to conflict transformation um, because it helps people to find channels to address their conflict in a nonviolent way. Um, as indicated here, when there is a misunderstanding between two people and families, we encourage them not to use violence and aggression, but whenever there is a problem, look for an elderly person and make your complaint. And through this palaver had they instill in people the, a, a nonviolent attitude to addressing conflict, uh, uh, which is key. Um, the, all, additionally, the um, the efficacy of the palaver hat in the, at the community level also influence structural reforms at the national level, because in 2013, um, uh, President Johnson Sirleaf um, launched the National Palava Hat uh, Forum, which was also uh, for, uh, a recommendation from the Liberian Truth and Recon uh, Reconciliation Committee in 2009. And this was an, uh, in recognition of the efficacy and the important uh, use of this me mechanism in transforming conflict within um, communities. One of the things that was lacking
second here was the issue of inclusive decision making. Because the panel itself or the committee, whenever it's formed, is often male dominated. And because of that, you know, there are um, groups such as women and youth will often feel alienated in the process. And uh, when it comes to conflict, uh, uh, cultural transformation, sorry. Um, the, the, the use of the palaver hat itself is a demonstration of maximizing homegrown um, 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 resources and practices. Um, one of the key thing here was the recognition also that cultural transformation is very sensitive. And so it's, a, it's more longer term. So changing the cultural patterns uh, was a bit limited in, 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 in that respect because, uh, because Liberia is a patriarchal society, a lot of this cultural element, is, it, it takes a very longer time to change. The Palava had, even though the Palava had contributed significantly to uh, conflict transformation, there are also, also constraints, part of which I've already mentioned. It was, it's often described as a gentleman's world because of the exclusion of women and, and youth uh, and, and the dominancy of men in the, in the process. So, and I, again, this is linked to the patriarchal society, the patriarchal nature of the Liberian society. Um, others also found that the let bygones be bygones um, uh, uh, mantra is, was, was not enough because um, sometimes when people are hurting from the pain that is caused by, by, uh, by the perpetrator um, and then you just say let bygones be bygones, sometimes it's not enough. So they felt like under the Palava had sometimes they have to relinquish their right to retributive justice in order to uh, you know, preserve social relations and, and, and peace. Um, another uh, uh, shortcoming is also the stack tradition, and this was particularly found in one community in Coman Hill, uh, called Coman Hill, where after the Palava had process, they prefer to do the Palava had process privately, especially when it is between an elderly person and a young person, and the younger person is encouraged or obliged to for uh, to ask for forgiveness, even if the older person is in the wrong because they believe that an elderly person cannot be chastised in, 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 in public. And while that is good in preserving sort of a relationship between the elderly and the youth, um, it also um, projects an unfair treatment for young people and, um, and also the potential for elderly persons to take advantage of this pro uh, pro uh, culture and then do as they please um, with impunity. It is important for me to note here that these challenges do not in any way diminish the, the, the efficacy and relevance of this local uh, of the Palava Hats to conflict transformation uh, within these communities, because often the, these challenges are used as argument to portray such mechanisms as illiberal or to use to sideline or ignore their usefulness uh, uh, in conflict prevention or peace building in general. But despite these challenges, they have within them uh, peace building values and ethos, which are very instrumental and in, uh, in, in transforming conflict within communities, hence must be leveraged in the process. So I'd like to conclude that um, African, a lot of African countries have within them these local mechanisms and um, they have low, uh, they have um, local legitimacy and promote a peace that is locally led. And so it is important that we harness and leverage these mechanisms um, to build, peace, um, to, to ensure sustainable peace building. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, okay, where, where do we start with the Palava Hut? Um, I mean, they're, they're obviously uh, kind of I mean, you just you you look at these. They're in, as I understand them, they're embedded all over uh, uh, Liberia. Uh, they're accepted, you know, kind of. They have legitimacy all over Liberia. Different forms, different uh, kind of systems, etc. Different ethnicities or whatever. So, so I think we're really on to a winner uh, with these in terms of their their legitimacy. But the uh, the thing I would like to draw out of this uh, discussion, if I if I may. Uh, it, it's the idea that uh, are they doing a job that uh, they weren't initially set up to do? Uh, you, you've got the whole idea of a uh, kind of a, a you know kind of a, a civil war, uh, kind of a, a, you know, atrocities, kind of unmentionable atrocities in in many ways. There's a lot of healing to be done essentially, 
And if we go back to that 2013 decision of the state to adopt Palava Huts, uh, the whole idea that there's buy-in from above, which again is another positive thing. So not only have we got buy-in from below, it's it's uh, it's embedded within the communities. The state wants to support and recognise it to some extent. But it's it's the whole idea that uh, again, uh, as I understand it, the TRC handed over the names of seven thousand six hundred people that they wanted to kind of report to uh, the, these huts and justice will be done, uh, kind of reconciliation will be done and peace will, will be the outcome. And I, I would like to get a, a sense from you if I can, Nancy, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, but <laughs> was, that, was that fair to do that? Were the Palava cut, uh, huts ever going to be able to cope with this, this level? And I'll perhaps enumerate why that, that there may be difficulty there. Uh, so is it fair to actually ask these institutions to take on that particular job at this particular time under those particular uh, uh, circumstances and uh, kind of probably more importantly kind of as a political scientist you always look well did it work as in uh, can we can we actually find evidence that uh, this system coped with something it wasn't meant to be doing to some extent and you know kind of it, it was a positive thing or has the state just dumped 7,600 cases effectively on, on local uh, uh, institutions that, that can't come with it. So kind of were those 7,600 cases dealt with uh, successfully or not, kind of were the outcomes suitable for, well, uh, uh, primarily the victims, one would assume, but also the communities that are there. And just some kind of, the, you know, kind of the ideas, and I think you've, you've touched on these, Nancy, already, really, but kind of uh, were, are these courts legitimate in the eyes of, uh, kind of the communities, the individuals, the victims, and indeed the perpetrators to, to some uh, extent. Um, are they able to cope with kind of uh, a, a national civil war? This isn't just a local dispute. It isn't just a, a land dispute amongst uh, kind of neighbours. Uh, it, it could be kind of, you know, warring factions uh, from different parts of the country, de different ethnicities, different communities maybe. Do they translate into the urban areas, perhaps, uh, kind of where there's uh, kind of uh, not one, uh, well, kind of say a more confusing community kind of uh, uh, the inputs feeding into that community, shall we say? Um, and uh, you know, and and I guess my biggest question is: Are they able to cope uh, with with the cases that? That would now come to them, uh, not not just land disputes, kind of uh, kind of local theft, kind of you know, kind of low crimes and misdemeanors. But you know, is there any competency within these uh, these huts to actually deal with kind of the uh, you know the atrocities and uh, and uh, you know can well yes can they cope and should they cope? I guess is another question. You know, is it is it not the case that kind of a, a local community justice system is not suitable for dealing with the crimes of a, 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 a civil war. So, uh, um, sorry, lo loads of questions there, but, <laughs> but, but essentially do, do they work in terms of the, the peace building, a post, you know, kind of a reconstruction of post civil war peace building, yeah. I guess is my main question. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Thank you very much, Alex. And, and these are very interesting questions. Um, so with regards to the TRCs, given over 7,000 um, um, cases to this uh, uh, local or um, actors to use the, through the Palava Hat process. Um, I, I do know that following um, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's um, launch of the National Palava Hat Forum um, for, for the National Reconciliation in 2016, it was it was piloted, you know, to test its efficacy in dealing with, you know, um, um, low um, low level. Um, crimes that came out of the war, such as, you know, um, looting and all those other crimes that came from the war. So it was used to address um, in, in dealing with that. And this was piloted in two um, 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 districts, um, Chen District and Vonjema District. Uh, and, and so out of, and, and it was piloted for two months. And uh, within the two months, of the 269 cases that was brought to this Palava Hat, um, 
um, um, about 177 of those cases were addressed amicably. And this was not able to, uh, the TRC was not able to get to do this, to do this. So it, 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 by, by, by um, piloting it and testing the efficacy, it tells you that Palava Heart can work. It has the potential to work if well leveraged, if well uh, um, leveraged with national, uh, you know, support or policies, it's able to uh, um, help um, 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 communities find amicable solutions um, to, to, to their, com uh, their conflicts or to even um, 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 conflict um, issues that came out of the Civil War, not just to social conflict, but issues that also came out from the Civil War, because this has been tested and, 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 and proven. Um, do they have legitimacy? Indeed, they have legitimacy within these communities. And like I said earlier, a lot of the communities, a lot of even at the national level, the Palava Hat is very well respected and accepted uh, within uh, these areas and, and, and people trust it because they believe it's more fair uh, 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 in, in addressing uh, the issues. They believe that the panel is not afraid to tell them that they are in the wrong, but rather call out their wrongs and also find amicable way to collectively address the conflict. So yes, they have the legitimacy. And in terms of coping, I mean, um, yes, they have a lot of each, uh, cases they deal with. And some of them indicated that they deal with like two to five cases a week, uh, um, others more than that. Um, but also that they, they are able to support the formal institutions. Interestingly, there is a collaboration there. Um, where sometimes the formal institutions, which is overburdened, often overburdened with all, all, all the cases that comes to them, actually gives cases to these uh, um, um, local actors or to address them through the Palava Hat um, process. And they get, uh, 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 and this is part of the alternative dispute resolution process or mechanism. So they, 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 they um, they transfer cases to the Palava Hat. And also because the Palava Hat, under the Palava Hat, it addresses um, civil cases or social conflict whenever there is criminal cases, which is, this, which is supposed to be dealt with by the state, like murder and all those things, they also take such cases to um, the formal institution. So there is a bit of collaboration there in, in, in dealing with that. Does it translate into the urban areas? Yes, in the urban areas, all the different ethnic groups that have migrated uh, uh, um, within into uh, into Morovia, for example, they have their quarter chiefs, they have their different tribal groups, and so they have what they call the tribal courts. So, which is a, a, which is a similar to the Palava Hat process. So, in the urban areas, they are called tribal courts. Uh, in the urban, so they exist um, within the uh, uh, urban areas as well. Yes. Just one follow-up, if I, I may. It's uh, so it's the idea that uh, the the Palava Hut can only produce a certain level of reconciliation and peace building if it's if the uh, the, the crime being discussed is is too severe, then it, it needs to be referred to the state. Is is that the case, or do the huts actually try and build? Uh, do they play a, a role in kind of more? I'm, I'm uh, grasping for a phrase here. It's it's uh, kind of the you know, kind of the, the, the I was going to say the serious, but that's very patronising, is it? It's kind of you know, the tricky the tricky bits of reconciliation. You know, kind of it's a crime that is so atrocious or so significant to the state of Liberia, then it, 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 you know, would 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 the state be willing to leave that to a local community to sort out, or would the state? want to be involved to protect its own interests or exercise its own interests? I mean, I think that um, that is, like I said, where the state and the local, um, these local mechanisms, local actors intersect and collaborate. Um, because I, it's not that the Palava Hat cannot be used to address murder cases or anything, but I think that it's, it's, it's a sort of a, an agreement between the states that, uh, in, whereas the state would deal with both the civil and, and criminal cases, um, the uh, non-state uh, actors uh, can use this mechanism to address civil cases. And this goes back to the Interland Regulation of 1905, uh, which sort of 
highlighted some of these rules for say local chiefs and the states and what the, the Palava Hut can be used to do. So this has become an understanding all these years um, uh, in, in, in the non-state actors using the mechanism to address only civil cases. But it by no means, it does not mean that the Palava Hut cannot be used to address these matters. They can be, uh, um, but it's just because of the uh, uh, understanding, if I would put it that way, uh, or between the state and the international and uh, these local actors or groups. And my, my final question, if I may, uh, do you kind of, from your research, do you, do you feel at any time that uh, uh, the human rights, uh, the natural rights of the uh, the perpetrator or the accused were, should we say, abused or ignored by the court? And if they were, is there any is there any mechanism of appeal, or do you just have to accept the outcome of the hut, as it were? Thank you. Um, like I said, uh, uh, the process is it's, it's towards a win-win, right? So at the end of the day, the perpetrator and the aggrieved comes to an amicable solution. Um, so if, in, 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 and this bits on, I think one thing I, I, I was not able to touch on is consensus and compromise. So at the end of the day, there has to be consensus of the uh, outcome that is you know, delivered at the end of the day. Um, so if there is no consensus, if, if the two parties do not agree on the outcome or decisions made, the Palava Heart process will continue. And that is one of the interesting things, there's the patience to continue to reconvene another session to make sure that everybody's needs are met in the process. So the perpetrator is given that space to, to argue his case, to, to share what happened, and then the aggrieved person the same way, and whatever each of them are supposed to have, at the end of the day, the outcome must be an amicable and one that is accepted by both parties uh, um, and, and, and before um, the Palava process for that case, for example, it, it comes to an end. So if one party feels that their um, um, issue is not addressed, um, the process will continue, or they have the right to also seek other uh, uh, avenues if they want to. But the process is patient enough to make sure that everybody, both the perpetrator and the agreed person's needs are met in the end. Thank you, Nancy. I'll now quickly open up the floor for the question and answer session. The, what's the history of these Palava huts? Did they exist pre-conflict? What local infrastructures for peace existed pre-Civil War and how effective were they? Thank you very much for that question. Like I said before, the Palava had existed long before even the Civil War. It, it, it has been a part of Liberian culture uh, uh, and, and process of, you know, we, uh, um, building peace or process of transforming conflict and recon uh, reconciling and people. So it, it, it's history days back to even um, pre, uh, um, pre Liberia, uh, when it was called the Malakut Coast, um, when before the slaves arrived from the, Amer uh, the United States. So the Palava Hat has been part and parcel of the history and culture of the Liberian people. Um, what LIPs existed pre war? I mean, different LIPs existed uh, uh, um, before the war, but then ones that I really looked at mainly, um, you know, um, a lot of these LIPs, for example, the Chiefs and Elders Council, they existed before and um, they were effective, particularly in, in also contributing to finding solutions to the conflict when it's the, the civil war, when it started, some of these chiefs and elders councils were part of the process of talking um, with these um, warring factions in dealing with the conflict. So they were there, they were effective, but they were not given the spaces to really fully operate and achieve and, and contribute effectively to the uh, um, uh, civil war or to resolving that. Thank you. Um, I'll start with a comment. Being Nigerian, when you say palaver in Nigeria, it is a major problem. <laughs> so now for me, hearing about palaver hurts and palaver related to peace is really interesting because Nigeria, we say 
a lava deal. So it's like there's a major problem. Maybe I don't have money or there's a big problem. Yes. Thank you. So, yeah, I agree with you on that. And um, that's what I talked about, the fact that in Liberia to palava means conflict or problem. Uh, and so they, they use it as a way um, to connote a place that you go to resolve conflict. Um, but in recent times, there's also the call for peace heart. It's also called peace heart because people believe that, like you said, palava means trouble. So it doesn't connote the right meaning. So peace heart rather demonstrate that it's a place easily people can recognize it's a place that you go to address your conflict, yeah. Thank you, Nancy, for this really excellent and inspiring uh, presentation about your work. Um, I wondered, because uh, as we know, children were particularly affected by the civil war in Liberia. Um, you know, we've read about child soldiers and you mentioned the issue of stack tradition of the difficulty of questioning the elders. I wonder in your interviews, whether you focused on young people, whether you spoke with young people and whether they felt that the, the peace huts had helped them or whether you, there were any kind of generational challenges or differences in perspectives when you were speaking to people about how they experienced this? Yeah, um, the stack tradition. And, and I must say that this is the, the only community that, that I found that this tradition was um, fair. In other communities, they noted that when the elders does wrong, they, they actually tell him he's wrong and let him apologize regardless of who he is. So um, I, this is not representative of every community in Liberia, but mainly um, specific to um, Coleman Hill community. Um, yes, I engage with young people and um, uh, a lot of the young people also like the approach. But like I said, they, they mentioned about the fact that the, the exclusive nature of it, uh, which has been male elderly dominated, not allowing them to, 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 to participate freely is one of one that was a big challenge to them. So to them, it felt like they are, sometimes their voices are not heard. Uh, because of that. So that was one of the main challenges for young people, especially, and similarly for women as well. Um, and, uh, so this is one of the gaps that was found in the Palava Hat process. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nancy. I just wanted to ask a bit more about sort of issues of uh, male dominance and, uh, and patriarchy, which you, you touched upon. And, um, you know, these are processes presided over by uh, chiefs and, and elders who, as you said, are predominantly men. Is there a, a, a serious flaw here when it uh, as regards, um, you know, justice for, for women, particularly issues of uh, domestic disputes, domestic violence, gender-based violence, are they sort of unlikely to, uh, or satisfactory solutions to be, to be found in such cases? Are women under pressure to uh, accept um, solutions through this process of consensus that may not be acceptable to them. Um, would the sort of formal institutions, the courts and um, uh, domestic violence legislation sort of not offer a better solution than, um, than these sort of local level uh, dispute uh, reconciliation mechanisms? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I agree with you and then being male dominated causes that challenge. And as I said before, in response to Jess's um, uh, question, um, this um, makes women feel that sometimes their needs are not met. Um, but like I said, the, um, the, the, one of the ways that has been addressed is this the women peace hats that's uh, emerging as well. Um, and these women peace hats are, are largely women dominated and, and also they engage in the Palava hat process. Uh, uh, and so there um, 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 and, uh, and that process, um, which is often led by um, the panel is made up only women. A lot of the gender-based violence issues go there in recent times. But even prior uh, uh, to that, um, one that the main palava had, um, um, we have we had is whenever there is an issue uh, with regards to gender-based violence, um, they bring in a, a woman is present. Uh, who is part of the panel, um, of course, dominated by men, but the woman is present who's part of the panel. So often make room um, for, 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 for addressing these um, 
um, um, um, um, gender-based violence issues. And I agree, there, there are gaps there. Um, is, 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 is the formal institutions um, a better option? Um, um, it depends. It depends on, on the community, on the people, because a lot of these co formal institutions also do not exist in a lot of these communities. So sometimes the option is taken away and, uh, from them. And sometimes also um, um, they, uh, there is a preference for these mechanisms because at the end of the day, it brings more peace to the people. So I think that it, 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 it depends. It has a potential, it has a uh, downside, but it, um, it, um, um, I agree with you that um, there is a bit of a gap there when it comes to that element of dealing with gender-based violence if in the process of, uh, of, of, uh, of a, a panel that is largely male-dominated, yeah. First of all, thank you very much, Nancy. That was a, a really interesting presentation. Um, I think I'd like to ask a bit more about the specifically sort of post-Civil War nature of these institutions, because in a lot of the literature about sort of post-Civil War situations, sort of authority in a community is often been sort of fragmented and the, a lot of the social contract is broken down so i was wondering these palava huts they seem to rely on a sort of naturalized authority within a community a sort of culturally embedded authority but if this is a community where that authority has been sort of riven apart by the conflict i wonder if in the kind of setting that you've described if that actually ends up sort of re-embedding what isn't an older cultural tradition but is actually the sort of direct product of the conflict in the sense that i sometimes feel when we sort of idealize culturally embedded institutions of reconciliation often they're actually far more recent inventions and far more products of the civil war itself so i was wondering if in your research you found that Besides the kind of general opinion that found the, uh, a dispute had been dealt with well, if there were marginalized communities that might have been on other sides of the actual conflict itself, and if they felt like they were excluded from the new sort of arrangement of power, and maybe more generally, if you could speak to these huts as like institutions of local authority in a community as well. So like I said, and I, I hope I remember your question correctly, like I said, um, these uh, palava huts uh, is it's it's not a product from the civil war. It's 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 been there. It's it's a culture that has been there for uh, for a long time. Um, but the palava hut is also evolving. Um, as a culture, it's evolving, it's taking into consideration the dynamics uh, that has occurred from the Civil War, and it is evolving. So, for instance, um, a lot, the different local infrastructures for peace, whenever they organize it, they also try to, for instance, um, um, have more diversified group in the, in, in the Palava Hat Committee to deal with uh, the, 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 the different issues that come. So it's, it's been there, but it is evolving and it is, and it is improving and, and, and it is taking recognition of the changes that has occurred um, within, uh, 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 within Liberia and within these communities um, specifically. Uh, um, with regards to the other uh, groups feeling marginalized, I think that, um, of course, it's also linked to what I mentioned earlier about these different sects of groups, be it women or youth or different communities feeling that they have been marginalized. And that is likely to occur. Um, however, there is a, a space where um, um, they, they, they kind of come together to discuss and also continuously engage to find the common grounds in dealing in dealing with with the issue at hand. Um, so yeah, I I, I um, the Palava Hat is a, is is an old and a long standing tradition which is continuously evolving and finding different mechanisms to actually um, fit and reflect the current challenges or changes within the Liberian society. So so one last question. It's great to see local peace. Infrastru infrastructures like Palava Hat are making critical positive contributions to the to peace building in Liberia. Now, if you think about perspectives from the state building, I wonder 
those successes made by uh, local peace infrastructures, if they undermine the state legitimacy and authority, which is also important for uh, any post-conflict countries. Did you sense any kind of, uh, from your interviews and the conversations that you had with the participants, do you feel that uh, the state is undermined because of that um, uh, local PC infrastructures? Mm. Thank you very much, Mio. And um, I would like to say again that the Palava had um, itself is, is a mechanism that um, these local peace infrastructures use. So it's not a local peace infrastructure in itself, but it's the local peace infrastructures are these community-based groups and they use these practices to as a way of uh, uh, um, addressing conflict. So the Palava had, yes, um, um, uh, is a mechanism that are used in, the, in, the, in that sense. Um, as to undermining the state, um, there was no sense of that um, necessarily undermining the state. And, and as I, 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 I mentioned earlier, um, there are even points of collaboration where the state takes issues to this uh, Palava Heart processes or to these LIPs, and then um, they also send issues back. So there is a point of, of collaboration there. But of course, being a state, the state and then the, uh, the local um, um, actors, there's always the point of contention uh, in, in that regard as to um, sometimes what can be done, who should do it, and, and how it should be done in that sense. So yeah, there are some um, contentions, but it wasn't really clear during my, my, my field research. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Nancy. I'll now hand over to Jess for a quick vote of thanks and some information. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you, Alex, and to all the participants for a really fantastic and engaging, and as Reward says, really riveting and insightful presentation. It's really been a pleasure to, to be with you this evening. Um, we're sorry we went slightly over time, but I think it was really worth it to, to continue the debate and the discussion. Um, we'd just like to mention that we really want this Africa Research Group, uh, led by CTPSR, to continue. Uh, we're hoping to have another session kind of every two months as a minimum. So we hope you'll join us again, or if you have suggestions or ideas, either for your own research or speakers that you would like to invite to this Coventry-based forum, we'd be very happy to, to facilitate that and work together with Zainab and the team to, to make that happen. So a huge thank you to everybody. Mm -hmm.